as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window, and she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She was born the daughter of a king and raised in the royal household. Just around the time when Michal was becoming a young woman, growing into marriageable age, there was a young shepherd boy making a name for himself in her father's kingdom. He was strong and courageous. He'd gone to battle with a giant named Goliath that no one else would face. And he was handsome. And he sang and played the lyre. He was out fighting battles on her father's behalf. When he returned home, the crowds would surely line the streets again, chanting David's name. Many people said David was becoming even more popular than Saul, their king, her father. She'd heard that Saul had offered Merab, her older sister, to David in marriage. But while David was off at war, Saul had married Merab off to someone else. So Michal let it be known that she loved David. She made sure word made it to her father's ear. I imagine she waited with bated breath. How many days did she pace, feet cold on the hard stone floor, hands clammy, heart racing to hear about her future? How her heart must have soared when she heard, was it through her servants, that her father had proposed the marriage she hoped for? David's response came in deferential form to the king. No, I'm, I'm too poor. I'm not worthy to be son-in-law to the king. Never mind that he didn't return her affections or that no one talked to her about it. This was the way things were done, and this would be a good match for her. Certainly, they'd work it out. How her heart must have stopped when she heard about Saul's response. Oh, no, no bride price, only just bring me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. It was a setup. Her father didn't care who she loved. He wanted to send David into an impossible battle where he would surely be killed. But he wasn't. David did it. He slaughtered a hundred Philistine men, returning to Saul with his grotesque proof of victory. So her father handed her over to a man she loved, but into a marriage sealed by blood and terror. She saw the look in Saul's eyes, a look of fear at David's strength, a look mixed with absolute hatred of David's popularity among the people. She knew that her husband had become her father's enemy. So Michal wasn't too surprised some time later when she learned that Saul had made plans to kill David himself. That night, she told David to flee. Did she have rope or did she tie together the bedsheets, bracing her body against the wall, her arms straining at his weight? She let David down through the window so that he could escape to safety. She took 
a statue. How heavy must it have been? She put it with some goat's hair in the bed, made it look like he was lying in it, so that when the messengers came in the morning, she told them, he can't, he can't come with you, he's sick. The messengers left, and they reported this to King Saul, but he made them return. If he's too sick to get up, carry him in his bed and bring him to me so that I can kill him in it. When Saul uncovered the truth, he was livid. Why have you deceived me? He shouted at me, call. Why did you let my enemy escape? Her husband, her husband whom she loves, why did she let him escape murder? She lies. He threatened to kill me. Saul has nothing to say to her. He's not done using her, though. David is off somewhere in the countryside fighting, ravaging villages, and, by the way, taking several more wives. How many months does Michal wait, hoping David will realize the sacrifice she's made, waiting for him to care about her safety? longing for any sign of affection. How often does she sit by the window, scanning the horizon, looking for him to return home to her alive? Instead, it is Saul who comes to her. Without any apparent explanation, her father has decided that she is to be married to another man, Paltiel. Does she cry? She weep hot, burning tears? Does she rage, yell, beg? Or has she given up by this time? Does she presume David is dead? Or that her marriage just doesn't count if she's been abandoned? How long has it been? So she lives as Paul Tiel's wife. They're further out of town now, removed from the center of things. But eventually she hears word that her father Saul has died in battle. I wonder if she grieves him or if she just feels relieved. And then she learns that the war has shifted Now the house of David and the house of Saul fight one another for control of the kingdom. But what is that to her way out in Galim? Except that one day, with, again, no warning, soldiers sent by her brother show up at her house. Ishbal has been sitting on the throne of Saul, and in negotiations with David he has agreed to return her to him. Was she there among a group of women pounding the flower? Was she sitting alone, mending clothes, or maybe reclining with her husband after their evening meal? It doesn't matter. She is taken. And as she is forced along, she sees that Paltiel is following, weeping the entire way. But when they arrive, the commander of the army tells Paltiel to go back home. And he does. He turns and walks away. David does not love her. He does not treat her as a wife because any offspring she might have would continue Saul's lineage. He has many other wives and concubines with whom he does have children. He wants her only as a display of his power, his ability to demand the former king's daughter. 
After another military win over the Philistines, David decides it's high time to bring the Ark of the Covenant up to the city of David. It's a huge spectacle designed to ensure that everyone knows that David now holds both military and religious control. He's dancing, half naked in the street, vulgar and shameless. And Michal, used as a pawn by father and husband, afforded no dignity, stripped of all honor as daughter and wife, abandoned, held within the prison walls as a piece of property, looks out her window, sees King David, and despises him in her heart. This is the story of Michal, daughter of Anaoam, daughter of Ahmaz, and of Saul, son of Kish. I imagined some of her thoughts and feelings, but the story's all there in our scripture. If you've never heard of her, you are not alone. It's not a story we typically tell. David stepped over her, put her aside, and so do we. In our lectionary, in our storytelling. But we don't have to. We can make space for her here. I wonder how it changes our perception of this celebration with the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was the sacred vessel that Moses had built to God's own specifications, to be a place where the glory of God would dwell among the people. The covenant, the tablets of what we call the Ten Commandments, were placed inside this wooden ark. It was almost four feet long, just over two feet wide and just as tall. It had been overlaid with pure gold and had two gold angels on the top that formed the mercy seat for God's presence. It was placed on a special table and that inside the tent of meeting and that inside the tabernacle. And the Israelites carried that tabernacle throughout their time in the wilderness, moving, journeying as the cloud of God directed them. It was a place of particular holiness where God's presence with them was made tangible. And on this day, David gathers thousands of people with him to bring it to the place he has renamed the city of David. They're singing and dancing, all kinds of instruments, sacrifices, and shouting. For as much as I think that David is using this as a power play, I have to believe that the people's joy is genuine. The ark of God's presence is coming to them, they can once again have a place to draw near to the holy. But when I see these stories lay side by side, I wonder if it isn't a cautionary tale. How much do we miss when we move too swiftly past that one line Michal saw King David leaping and dancing and despised him in her heart. What else are we missing in the stories that aren't told? The stories we don't hear, the people we don't see. Where is Michal's story still playing out? You may not have heard of her before today. She may not have had any biological children. But Michal is 
your foremother in the faith. And she is mine. What does she still have to teach us about where we look for God's presence? There are places we come to know God's glory made manifest, made tangibly present to us. Places like this one. It is good to rejoice here and to sing with all our might. I trust that our honoring of the holy presence here is genuine. And God is present in each human being made in the image of God. What if we showed up rejoicing and singing in the lives of each person who's ever been marginalized, abandoned, or ignored? What if we made space for their stories? What if we told our own whole stories with all their pain? Maybe then we could dance in recognition of God's presence there too.